Revenue Chat Episode 146. Hey guys, Tony D'Urso here, and I have to say thank you. Thanks a million. A million downloads, that is. Go to TonyDurso.com slash donation and read all about the exciting next adventure we have in store for you. That's Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash donation. And once again, thanks a million. This is Revenue Chat Radio with your host, Tony D'Urso, interviewing successful entrepreneurs and giving you actionable advice and insights. Let's rev it up. Welcome to this episode of Revenue Chat. I'm your host, Tony D'Urso. I'm going on television in the near future as Revenue Chat TV, and I'll be broadcasting over many platforms such as Amazon, Apple, Roku, The Voice America TV Network, and others. My show format will inevitably change a little as I may ask guests to help solve current business and marketplace issues. Regardless of any adjustments, you continue to get experts in their field who share their knowledge with you, the audience. When it goes live, you'll see them on my mobile app at tonydurso.com slash mobile. Download that now and you'll see and hear my other weekly talk shows. Currently, column one is the spotlight, which focuses on high-profile celebrities who give great insight on their journey to success. And you get good advice and information that you can use in your life and business. Column 2 has my Revenue Chat radio podcasts, such as the show you're listening to now. And when the TV show comes on, you'll catch it on this app. So please go ahead and download it at TonyDurso.com slash mobile. Okay, today we set the stage for Revenue Chat with Bill Morgenstein. Knock down, get back up. All right, Revenue Crew, let's rev it up. Get ready for Bill to tell us, knock down, get back up. Here we go. Today we set the stage for Revenue Chat with Bill Morgenstein talking about knock down, get back up. And for our Revenue Crew audience, here's some facts about our guest, Bill Morgenstein. First of all, He was my first guest on live blog talk radio about two and a half years ago when we had probably just two or three listeners compared to the tens of thousands that I get now. So Bill was the first person that I've had. And now here's some facts about him. University of Alabama, BS in banking and finance. He's a past president of Kitty Kelly Shoe Corp. He's the CEO of Marquesa International and Marquesa Import Corp. Vice President, Advanced Me Corp. Senior Vice President, Sterling Funding, LLC. Area Governor of Toastmasters International, which I love. I'm in Toastmasters. He's a founder and chairman, IFA, that's the International Footwear Association. Past Executive, VP, and founder of FDRA, that's Footwear Distributors and Retailers of America. He's author of the popular book, which keeps getting more and more popular, The Crazy Life of a Kid from Brooklyn. He's a life member of 200. 110 associates. Who can say that? That's amazing. And he had a great military career, which we'll ask a little bit about shortly, and we've talked about in earlier episodes as well. And any one of those by themselves is incredible, Bill. And here you are. You're doing it all. Welcome to Revenue Chat. Thank you. My pleasure. Sounds like this will be fun. With you, it's always a blast. This is just really, really an honor to have you on. I just love it. And I got to ask, Bill, with everything that you've done in your life, I'm curious, what made you get into the business world of financing? Besides, of course, the fact that perhaps you love to deal with money. I got into that after I finished my regular career and I had thought about retiring, which I ended up doing just after two weeks. 
for the first, I had two retirements. One was for two weeks, one was for 10 days. Bill, you and, keep retiring. Uh, We're going to ask you about that, too. <laughs> That's <funny>. Okay. <laughs> Then I, I got into, uh, because I had a banking degree, I, I knew about finance, I knew about bankers, I had associations with bankers, and I got into that, and uh, there's no stopping it. it. It gets more interesting and more fun every day, right up until today. I'm working on uh, some very exciting things uh, almost as we speak. Well, that's very cool. Well, dealing with money is always very, very exciting. And you not only you've dealt with money, you've dealt with so many people. You've had so many mentors. You learned from great people that today's audience probably has not heard of. But I'd love to ask about some of these people that you felt made the biggest impact on you for your success. I would say the two that are known, one maybe not so well-known, Frank Rooney, who was president of uh, the Melville Corp, which was a predecessor to CVS and, and companies like that, Tom McCann Shoes, Miles Shoes, Mill Disco, which, which dealt a lot with Kmart. So they, uh, and he was very successful. When he left, all that fell apart and Melville went down. But he was an absolutely great mentor. And, and then... When I started, when I got out of the service and I started in the business world or the working world, uh, we were trained by Peter Drucker, and you won't get a better mentor than that. We we spent a week with him, and to this day, I, I remember uh, things that he said. He was very Im impactful, and I, I think you, you learn to work with mentors and, and learn from people who have experience and that, frankly, were a lot smarter than I was. Yeah, Peter Drucker is one of the greats. You know, I just interviewed, it's somewhere in the shows, there's an interview coming out with Hank Moore, who's been interviewed, not only interviewed by Peter Drucker, Peter Drucker had written a, a review on one of his books and so forth. And also in, when I was doing my, getting my degree at the University of Laverne, of course, in management, multiple management classes that I had, Peter Drucker's all over the place. We've studied him quite a bit. Absolutely, absolutely. Though his writings should be read by anybody that is or wants to go into business. Having said that, you you can also learn from from humble and simple people. And uh, frankly, they were always the ones that I respected the most. That's very interesting. Could you say who made the most impact on you and how that helped you in your career? Well, I was having some tough times. I just got fired from a job that I had and I was uh, I was pretty down I thought it was uh, I, th I thought it was unfair and uh, fellow kind of took me by the hand and uh, just gave me some insight of things to do and things uh, not to do uh, you know for looking for uh, for other for another job and uh, it was just uh, it, it, it was just something that worked out uh, very well and I uh, Sadly, I don't remember the person's name. I do. I do remember him. I can picture him in front of me. But it was just. He uh, it, it just came along at a time that that it was needed. Very cool. I got gotcha. you. And we all have people that come at the most unexpected times sometimes and help us or give us something, some piece of advice that we use later. My life is full of little anecdotes and little stories here of people that have said something which at the time maybe not maybe did not change things or do anything but later on it was like oh yeah that little piece of advice just comes in and you've had absolutely yep and you've had such a great advice i touched on your military career in this little bio i'd love to ask you can you tell us a little bit about what you did in the military and how that went with you well, I have to say how it started with ROTC, and uh, I, I did happen to like ROTC. I, I don't always like to be ordered around, which I guess is typical of a lot of people, but I did enjoy the Air I was four years in the Air Force ROTC, and when I uh, finished that, I thought I was going to get become an officer, and I was told that I had, they had no quota that I would have to fly, become a pilot which I would love to do, but I wore glasses. So that was out, disqualified me. And I, they said, well, you made good grades. We're going to give you an opportunity. I was married at the time at the University of Alabama. And they said, if you spend another, take another year of Army ROTC and you have to go to summer school to catch up, you'll get your Army officer's rank. 
And so I went to, I, I did go to the summer school. It was a hot summer in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Finished it, got through with that. And then they said, well, sorry, we have no quota. So about a year later, after staying working in uh, Hills of Tennessee, I uh, was drafted as a private, as a book private. You know, I and, remember a story you once told me of a prank you did in the military on getting everyone to show up for a dress parade. Could you share that with us again? <laughs> yeah, that that was that that was in the ROTC. Uh, you know, the uh, in the summertime, the the uniforms were uh, we had these hot woolly uniforms, and uh, it was. Uh, uh, it was getting into the sun room, and it was hot, and it looked like it, uh, as it rained, the parades were called off. There was a parade uh, every Friday or Saturday, I'm not sure of the day, but there was a parade once a week, and, and you had to dress up in these hot uniforms. And, and I, I said, you know, I just don't, I, I, I just can't abide this. It's just too hot for me. So I called the actual officer's headquarters and said, uh, how come, I says, I said, you have to call off the parade because nobody showed up at the Tuscaloosa airport to meet General Dykema. General Dykema was the head of the Air Force contingent in that whole area, and he was in charge of the ROTC units. And of course, they went into a panic. They uh, they said, you know, we didn't, we never got any notice about it. I said, well, didn't you get our telegram? They said, no. I said, well, you know what? Call off the parade and have every officer, uh, both the regular officers and the officers, the ROTC officers at the airport at noontime when, when the parade usually took place. And they all went down there. And of course, nobody showed up. And they sent a telegram to General Dykema apologizing for not meeting him at the airport. Well, he thought that they were drinking. <laughs> and he was ready to he was ready to to lower the grades of the officers because of their of, of their nonsense and and their inebriation. And I of course I for I don't know how long after that I was absolutely scared to death that they would find out that I because they would have thrown me out of school of course not only out of the ROTC but I would have been thrown out of the University of Alabama. You're such a prankster, Bill. That's just so funny. So I take it they never found unless some, unless someone listens to this podcast. They never, yeah. Unless yeah, if anybody, this goes back many years. So I don't think they're going to do anything now. Now I, I played another prank when I uh, after basic training I was sent to uh, the Chemical Corps in Alabama, McClellan, Fort McClellan, which was great because I lived in Birmingham and this was in Anniston, 60 miles away, and I would go ride back and forth. We uh, I shared a ride with the commanding officer, so I had a ride back and forth, so I knew I was going to get, I got home every night. And uh, I played a, a prank on somebody. They, uh, it, they, it was during the time of Korea, and I printed up some fake orders for one of the fellows because I knew he would get, he was kind of a nervous guy anyway. And he really went into a panic when he got the orders because they were fake. And they found out they were fake, and... Uh, because I apologized to him, I felt bad afterwards because he really got upset. Next month, I get a set of orders levying me from Fort McClellan to Korea. And I thought they were fake orders. I said, you know, whoever did these orders did such a fantastic job. They looked absolutely perfect. Well, they were perfect, and I was levied out to Korea. <laughs> Oh, Bill, you're always getting in mischief. Now, what would you say were the best lessons you've learned from the military, which has helped you become so successful in the business world? Well, you learn, uh, of course, basically, what you learn is discipline. You learn to obey orders. And even if you're running, you report to somebody. If you're running a company, you report to your customers. And in fact, you report somewhat to your employees also. You, you have that responsibility. And you report to the government because you have to follow laws. So that's, I think that is the basic thing that you uh, that you take from uh, the military, and and you 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 learn to be on time, which uh, which I'm a bug on. I mean, uh, I, the uh, uh, and, and my wife is the same way. We have somewhere to be. We're going to be there 15 minutes early, or or more. And uh, that's all part of discipline and and uh, and caring and doing what's right. 
That's very interesting about that because I do not like to be on time. I will not be on time. I must be early. And I've been like that since forever. Just like you, maybe I did not attend the U.S. military, but somehow I got that same lesson and I don't like to just make it on time. I like to be early. I like to arrive non-rushed and much more comfortable. And I find Whatever event I'm going to, I enjoy it a lot better because I'm not rushed. I like it on my own time. So very, very interesting point. And you know, with that, you've had so many employees in different corporations and businesses over the years. And you think discipline or this point is one of the key ones that you would like to share with the younger members of the audience today? I I think that's important. And the fact that you have to instill a sense of honesty and you not only have to instill it, you have to live it. And that was one of the things that was so great about the Melville Corporation. They were absolutely ethical in every way. And uh, they may may have been may have been an exception. I don't know. Uh, I mean, to the point that when I would hear about something that was nefarious, I would get shocked. I said, why would people do that? Why would people take a, a bribe as uh, as a buyer uh, in the company? I mean, I, I just didn't understand that. And I, it got to the ridiculous point where a, a close friend of mine said, I'm going to, sh- uh, he was telling me about a, uh, there was a company called W.T. Grant. I can say it now because they no longer exist. He says, uh, I'm going to show you, I'm going to pay off a buyer and I'm going to do it in front of you. And he's so brazen, he's going to take it. And he brought me along. And sure enough, the buyer came out and he handed him the envelope. And I saw there were bills sticking out of the envelope. And he took it and he put it in his pocket like it was nothing. And I I was just completely shocked by it. And I'm not shocked today because I'm not quite that naive as I was. But that was instilled by the company. And 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 I'm glad it was because that I was instilled by that uh, from my parents. So I, I would hope it'd be a hallmark for everybody. You know, you would think so, Bill. However, there are countries where bribe is the order of the day. We're not going to go name names or anything. And it is in budgets. They may have different names for it these days, but they're bribes to get the deals. But we're not going to go there. You and I, we didn't make our success in our life on bribes or going down that road. We understand that that happens. And I also understand that I could have been even more successful if I did that. I, I, there were big customers I didn't get because I just wouldn't, do, I, I wouldn't go down that road. Well, you know, and, that's a good and point. I always, because, and frankly, yeah. I always wondered that I do the right thing. <laughs> but well, uh, that's very interesting because I think that yeah. if I would get like you know hundred thousand dollars and million dollar bribes, I think I would be more successful. So <laughs> on, yeah. the, on the receiving end, maybe there is something to it. <laughs> just a joke, eh, folks. Just a joke. I know. Is it true that a majority of new businesses fail? Check this out. In order to have a successful growing business, there are some vital points that you must know. You must have worked them out thoroughly. They must be synchronized with each other and all employees, consultants, and companies that you depend on must know these items and be in agreement with them if your new business is to meet with a high percentage of success. Get it free. The Vision Map, Beat the Odds for Business Success at Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash vision. Learn how to establish your vision, purpose, long-term objective, and master plan, including strategic and tactical planning. Get the Vision Map, Beat the Odds for Business Success at Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash vision, V-I-S-I-O-N. Hey guys, if you sometimes wonder how to get funding for your startup or even to keep your small business rolling, I know this scene. And I've got a great answer. Cabbage. No, not the food, but the money. That's right, money. Look it up. Yes, Cabbage, with a K, has the answer. Cabbage helps small business owners access simple and flexible funding right away without the headaches that come with applying for a traditional loan. And you can apply now online or from your phone by securely linking your business information to get an automatic decision. We all like automatic, right? Once you're approved, you choose when to use your funds and how much to take. You only have to pay for the funds you actually use. 
I like that. Visit cabbage.com slash revenue chat. There's no cost to apply or set up your line of credit. As a revenue chat listener, when you qualify for funding, you'll get a $50 Visa gift card you can use anywhere, even if you want to buy some of my books. Okay, just kidding. Well, kind of. That's cabbage with a K. K A B B A G E dot com slash revenue chat. You'll remember that K, right? Cabbage dot com slash revenue chat. And we're back with Bill Morgenstein, who tells us, knock down, get back up. All right, let's go into food. Now, this is very interesting because I'm going to ask you a very unusual question I haven't asked before. I know you love going to fine restaurants, and I want you to know I've been there, done that. I've eaten at some of the best restaurants in the world. I've done that tour. I've been through that. And there's something to be said about dining where you learn and you can apply principles from learning. For me, I'm the type of person I think that I can learn from just about any experience, good or bad. Because I always look at, well, what's the lesson here? But I'm curious about your restaurant experiences and what you've learned from eating at really good places and because they cater to the taste, they cater to the food, and how that may have helped you in your business life. Well, I think it, it, it may help because as you, maybe you looked up to, some, in, in some cases, you looked up to that, you say, well, you know, this person knows good wine, he knows good food, he likes good food. Uh, and, and also, when you go to good restaurants, if you're enjoying, it's a way of enjoying yourself, and that's contagious. So you go out with people who are getting away from the, may, maybe used to going to uh, chain restaurants and, and things like that. Not not that there's anything wrong with them. I go, I go to chain restaurants also, although I'm not a big fan of them, but there, there's certain, if there's a Nathan's hot dog place around, I'll go, I love Nathan's hot dogs, so I'm going to get a Nathan's hot dog. Sounds but I do good. like, I do like the fine restaurants. And it does, uh, I think that does, rub off on the people you're with that uh, they they many of them do appreciate it and maybe some say well that's pretentious and 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 maybe it is but that's something that i did like well let's flip that around bill let's talk about what's your worst restaurant experience does anything come to mind oh but oh, oh yeah do i <laughs> <laughs> do i have one i had i was going to paris I, and I was, I, I used to go like to, if I heard of a good restaurant, I always said, I got to, if I happen to be anywhere near it or, or maybe even make a special trip, I might go. But I had to be in uh, Paris. Uh, I read about a, 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 this great new restaurant that opened up in Paris that is almost impossible to get into. And uh, so I was going to Paris a month from now. I, I called up the owner of the restaurant and I said, I have, I'm bringing in, I have some buyers that I want to bring in. I heard so much about yours. And I gave, you know, I gave him the whole story. And he, he said, you know what? When you come into Paris in the morning, because you, you, when you fly in from states, you end up early in the morning, call me. He says, I'm in my restaurant from early in the morning right through closing time. He says, you call me. And when you call me, I'll, I'll hold the table for you for that evening. And I did that. Came in, got a hold of my buyers, called him, got a hold of my buyers, went out to the restaurant, but was not in the center of Paris. It was way outside in some warehouse section, industrial warehouse section. It, you have to picture the, you have to picture a cold, rainy, dreary Paris evening. And and we, we you can't in Paris you can't when you take a, a taxi cab you can't all fit into a, a taxi cab because they will they restrict you to just a few people in a cab. I think maybe the maximum is three people in the back seat. So we had to take a few cabs and we get out to this place and we go into the restaurant and they seat us immediately right in the front of the door. And what was strange was our, they didn't have a hat check place. They didn't have a place to hang your coat. So it was like if you go into the airline and you throw your coat on the, in the bin on top. It was like that along the wall. You threw your coats on the top. And it was not a very fancy looking restaurant. And every time they opened the door, the, the cold air and the rain 
came in, so I called over the maitre d' and I said, look, I have some of the people have colds. Is it possible to move us to the next table next to us or one of the other tables? And he says, uh, no, monsieur. All the other tables are reserved for our regulars. You're not a regular. Okay, what can, I, what can we do? So now, a few minutes later, somebody, a whole group comes in. They put us at the table that we would have liked to have sit, sat with right next to us. And right next to me, there is a big, they bring in a great big dog, which in Paris, you can bring dogs into restaurants. Big, wet, smelly dog oh, no. next to me. So now I call <laughs> the major D back. I said, you know, I'm allergic to dogs. Is it possible to please move us? I'm really not allergic to dogs. I'm to love dogs, but I didn't love this particular dog. So now the <laughs> owner sees this and he's glaring at me. And a few minutes later, he brings out a piece of, I think it was liver slaps it on the floor right next to me. The dog slurps it up and, I mean, I'm making those awful slurping noises, eating eating the liver <laughs> and gets through. A few minutes later, the dog does his thing right there on the floor. <laughs> and so to this day, I don't know. If you ask me how the meal tasted, I have no idea. We, we, we couldn't go anywhere because we're not near Paris. Yeah, and it's not that easy to get taxis where we were. And it was, you know, it was already in the evening. So we suffered through this. So now we go out, get in the, t- the taxi cabs. It's still raining and wet. And we get into the cab and I say, you know, I swear I smell that dog. I still smell the dog. And sure enough, in the front seat, a head pops up. There's a the, the driver has a dog, big dog next to him. What? Well, big wet dog next to him. Probably because they needed for protection, maybe. So we drive to the Maurice Hotel where I was staying, and he was not a particular. Not that there are any friendly cab drivers in tax in Paris, but he was not particularly friendly. And instead of dropping us off right by the canopy of the hotel, he dropped us off a half a block away. So what do you think? And in Paris, you know, they they don't pick up after their dogs. I guess it's beneath them to do that. Sure enough, what do you think I step in as I get out of the cab? So that, I'd have to say, was my worst hotel experience, my my worst food experience. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for sharing that. Yuck. I've had great experiences, but I have not gone to something like that. Oh, my (laughs) goodness. Oh, my goodness. Well, there's a lesson there to learn. And speaking of that, You got some interesting advice. I seem to recall you were working for an import-export footwear company, and I think you were going to leave it to form your own company, but you had a change. I think you got some advice to change what you were going to do. You want to tell us that story? Yes, I was leaving the company. I I had been doing everything for this company. I was doing the buying. I was doing the selling. I was doing the styling for them, and uh, I decided to – I wanted to go into my own business, so – I went in, I told the uh, boss, and he was very upset, and he didn't, he says, I don't want you to go. He says, I want to make a proposition for you. You work part-time, work half the time for the company, and half the time do your own business. So I said, well, let me come, go home, talk it over with my wife. I talk it over with my wife, and she says, look, I support you. If you want to go in, if you want to stay with the company, you stay with the company. If you want to go into your own business, you go into your own business. But the one thing you cannot do is to do both. She says it will absolutely never work. And that was probably the best advice I ever had. That's very interesting because today's entrepreneur, we've learned to multitask and we do multiple things. Some people have their, their day job. They hack that with some sideline. Some people have multiple businesses. Many entrepreneurs and business people that I speak to have multiple businesses and they've managed it. Why is that? Is that because we have computers, we have virtual assistants? Yeah, yeah, that's Why is right. that and different also, today? The, and this is the, the, the footwear business is a very complicated, it's a very complicated business and it's very intensive and, and it's also you're traveling. So, uh, I mean, how can I, uh, if I had to, and, and you travel, you could be traveling in Europe, you can be traveling in Asia and you can be traveling in South America, which we used to do. So it's hard enough doing that full time either for one company or yourself. You really can't split that. How do you split it up? I mean, you can't do justice to both. One of them would have to suffer and that- it wouldn't be, actually, it wouldn't have been fair to the company and it wouldn't be fair to me. And my wife recognized that right away. Very interesting. I get that the way you've put that now that makes sense because there are some things where 
you have to give it your all to make it grow, to make it successful. What was the final? Which way did you finally go on that story? Oh, no, I went into my own business. I started small and built up a, a pretty good business. Well, very good on you. Very good. And I mean, here you are ended, up, I mean ended up as a $55 million import-export business before it was finished. Hats off to you on that, Bill. Very, very nice. And now there's a question I asked at the very beginning. We talked about it very briefly. You retired multiple times, which kind of sounds funny. Do you want to tell us that quickly? How many times did you retire? I retired twice, once for two weeks, and I just couldn't take the boredom. And I answered an ad in the paper, and it was a, a company that I used to sell to, had a division and which had nothing to do with it was Montgomery it was Montgomery Ward. They had a division and I went to work just selling for them on commission. Ended up I was making so much commission that they said we're bringing you in as an executive <laughs> so, so you won't make quite as much and that went on for a while. Eventually they, they so did they sold the company to another company who I didn't like didn't feel comfortable with. So I retired again. And that second retirement was just for 10 days. And then I went to work for a uh, company that was involved with funding small businesses, small corporations and things uh, of that sort of and the unique, what they call merchant cash advance, which was just beginning. And now, now it's a big now it's a big thing. It's become uh, uh, very big. And uh, eventually I left that just to do the consulting that I do now for small, uh, relatively small businesses, small and medium sized businesses, both in funding and in sales training. Well, there you go. You've retired twice, and I presume you are out of retirement again, and you're working oh, on multiple yes, things. Yes, <laughs> yes, and I'm also promoting my. You know, I, I promote my uh, my book, which uh, was interesting, my autobiography, because I didn't write it for that purpose. But I have found, and maybe they save money. The companies save money by buying the book because they they're buying the book to give to their salespeople and their executives. So I guess for the Fourteen or fifteen dollars, or maybe even less, if it's if it's done on KDP through Amazon, they can buy a book and train their people. So and they buy, buy twenty books and they save money. Buy a thousand, everybody. This book is amazing. It's the the crazy life of a kid from Brooklyn dot com. Go to that site. Go to Amazon. Check out the book. The stories are amazing. I, I just can't get over some of the antics you've done. There's so many little stories, <laughs> things you can't get away with today, things that you would just surprise you, things you'll never see in any sitcom or comedy show. His life is crazy amazing. He's got a zillion reviews on his book, and I believe you're giving all of the proceeds to cancer. Yes, cancer research, because very sadly, uh, this year, October this year, my uh, oldest son passed away of cancer, and we, we spent quite a number of years trying to get him cured. We thought we had him cured at one point, and it just didn't happen. So, uh, yes, all the proceeds go to cancer, and then some. Very noble of you, and I'm sorry for your loss, and I'm sorry that that has happened. And it is an issue that we have to address, and your efforts are very appreciated in addressing that issue because we really do need to step up together as a world and tackle this. So good on you on that. And lastly, Bill, I did want to ask, the title of this interview is Knock Down, Get Back Up. Did we fully address this, or was there some well, other point no, you I, wanted you know, to? Well, no, you may have to have another whole another call on that subject because it's a uh, it's a it's it's a, it's a long subject. It was toward the end of my my regular company that I had Marquesa International. At the end of that, it was a con job that really cost me. I'm sorry to say millions, and uh, with a big company who I've never named. Because I know they would come at. I, I don't want to spend any more money on lawyers defending a defamation suit or anything. But uh, it, it was quite quite a story and quite interesting the way they uh, they. So what what really what what it amounts to, uh, uh, to put it in plain terms, I think I got too big for my britches and uh, it backfired on me. I got you. Well, I understand the story enough that you lost millions. You were taken out somehow, and yet. Even though you were knocked down, you got back up. And that's, I guess, the important thing. That's the takeaway here is no matter what comes at you, you can lie down and end it or you can get back up and keep at it.
Am I right? Absolutely. There Absolutely. You, you know, they, I, at one point I was in Golden Glows, and one of the things they t- teach you is no matter how many times you knock down, you get back up. If you get back up enough, you go, you'll win the fight. I like that. Well, Bill, thank you so much for hanging out with us on Revenue I, Chat. It was I thank great. you. Always a pleasure. I love and it, I love hope it. everybody enjoyed it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And obviously, we're going to have to bring you back on again. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I've had you on my podcast and show on Revenue Chat more times than anyone else. <laughs> well, this is the third time. I no, I, third or fourth. It's been oh, a lot. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, maybe fourth. <laughs> we'll okay. bring you on again another time, I'm sure. Well, once again, thank okay. you. Bill Morgenstein, knock down, get back up. All right. Thank you, everyone. And thank stay tuned to our next show on Revenue Chat. If you like this interview with Bill, would you kindly give me a review on iTunes? It's the purple icon on your Apple device. A sentence or two is just fine. Thanks in advance. Our next episode is with Dom Fawcett, talking about creating vulnerable leaders. Some facts about Don. He's a best-selling author. He's a leadership expert, executive coach, military veteran, prior police officer, over 10 years in corporate leadership, and CEO of Think, Lead, React. Dom talks about creating vulnerable leaders on the next episode of Revenue Chat. All right. Thanks again, everyone. And until next time, remember, you can make life better for yourself and everyone. Choose wisely.